tonight, the battle for Libya. President Obama says for the first time that Gaddafi has to go. While in Libya, scores turn out for a funeral in the capital as armed Gaddafi supporters patrol the streets. And in the eastern part of the country, rebels are strengthening their hold. I'm Russ Mitchell. Also tonight, escape from Libya. Americans evacuated from a brutal civil war get to tell the story of their journey to safety. Search for justice. More than 40 years after civil rights era crimes, a group of law students works hard to keep cold cases alive. And where's Banksy? An elusive street artist is leaving his mark on Los Angeles, and tomorrow may just have a rendezvous with Oscar. This is the CBS Evening News with Russ Mitchell. And good evening. It is already Sunday morning in Libya after a quiet but tense day filled with funerals and evacuations. And from the West, some very strong words from the President of the United States. Let's take a look at the latest. The capital city of Tripoli is in lockdown. The U.N. estimates a thousand people have been killed in the Civil War. And for the first time, President Obama says Gaddafi must leave Libya. We have a team of correspondents on this ever-changing story. And we begin tonight with Kelly Kobiea in Tripoli. Russ, good evening. It was a relatively quiet day in Tripoli today, although we did hear reports of Gaddafi arming civilians and sending them into neighborhoods to patrol. Having said that, we saw no signs of fighting today after a very violent Friday. In this working-class district of Tripoli, a hundred neighbors gathered to march, not to protest, but to mourn Anwar El Ghadi, killed, they said, in demonstrations against the government Friday. They described a massacre, a family killed in their car, armed African mercenaries using an ambulance for cover. They were killed by, by uh, the ambulance. Uh, they have uh, black people in it. And shoot uh, for... Yes, shoot yes. From, uh, they, they shoot in everywhere. They say that five people were killed here Friday, a day the government claimed went by without incident in Tripoli. Yet these small alleys and side streets are littered with evidence of violence. Blood-stained steps, broken glass, a charred police station. Some are vowing to protest until the regime falls, and they've just gained a valuable ally. A general in the special forces, one of the military units most loyal to Gaddafi, announced he's with the opposition. This is one of the many checkpoints along the road to Zawiya. They're keeping an eye on people coming in and going out, stopping some of the cars to check for weapons and loyalty. A green scar for a picture of Gaddafi means you're on the right side. The only crowds we found were at state-sanctioned rallies and on bread lines. If, as they stand in line for basic provisions, these people have stopped believing their leader, they are still afraid to say so openly. It's not true. It's lying. Where, where is the people killed in Tripoli? Not in where your are? neighborhood. Do you think in other neighborhoods? Maybe. Yeah, there is, there is some mistake that happens with some uh, uh, security uh, people. The government invited us here to show us that Tripoli is safe, peaceful, and under their control. But the gap between that image and reality is growing. Russ? Kelly, given that very violent Friday you spoke of a few moments ago, why do you think things have been so quiet there the last 24 hours or so? Well, we understand from the Qaddafi government that they actually are negotiating with uh, the opposition in the east. However, from what we saw on the streets today, from talking to people, it seems people in Tripoli are stocking up and preparing themselves for some hard days ahead. Kelly Kobiea in Tripoli. Thanks. Of course, the battle for Libya is being fought on several fronts, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the eastern part of the country. Mandy Clark now from the city of Albida with a look at victims on both sides of the war. The protesters who took this video claim this man is a foreign mercenary, one of many brought in by Gaddafi's regime to kill Libyan demonstrators. He's seen begging for his life, but we have no way of verifying who he is or what happened to him. The People's Committee in Albaida took us to an improvised jail today to meet prisoners they say are a mix of mercenaries and Libyan soldiers who fought alongside them. Was he offered money to be a fighter for Gaddafi? All the men denied they were hired guns. 
This prisoner from Chad said he had been tricked so, into fighting. Did you shoot upon demonstrators? No one would admit that. No, I didn't. Libyan soldiers in the jail insisted they had no idea they would be fighting protesters. On the streets outside, the army was sending a very different message. This is a parade in the city of Maida, and the military is very keen to show they are from the other side of the protesters. And it wasn't just soldiers. We wandered into this protest tent and found a group of doctors singing, we're going to stay, stay, stay until the pain goes away. Across town at the hospital, these doctors were working hard at treating injured demonstrators. Abu Bakr Nahim, age 19, was shot six times. You've been injured quite badly. Are you happy that you went out and demonstrated that day? Like all the injured we met, he insisted he had no regrets. It's worth it. It's worth it, yes. Yeah. Omar Abdullah is a soldier who paid a high price for refusing an order to fire on protesters. He got a gunshot to the arm. How could I shoot my people, he said. As doctors cleaned his wound, he raised his other arm to give us the protesters' victory sign. This town has seen some pretty serious fighting. Protesters even managed to overrun a military base, and now they're just hoping the remaining pro-Gaddafi units in the west of the country are just about to give up the fight. Russ. Mandy Clark in al Baida, Libya. Thank you. As we mentioned earlier, President Obama had some strong words this afternoon on the crisis in Libya, saying flat out that Muammar Gaddafi must leave now. Joel Brown is in the White House with more on that. Joel, good evening. Good evening to you, Russ. President Obama unequivocally putting Muammar Gaddafi on hold in a phone call to German Chancellor Angela Merkel. The president said Gaddafi was using mass violence as his only means of staying in power, that Gaddafi had lost legitimacy, and for the first time, that Gaddafi should leave now. And late last night, the White House rolled out new sanctions against Libya, blocking bank accounts and freezing the assets of Gaddafi, his regime, and senior and, and his children. The president had held back on calling for Gaddafi to step down until U.S. citizens were safely out of the country. Today, the president intensified the pressure. Russ. Joel Brown at the White House. Thank you very much. The number of people fleeing Libya continues to grow. At least 15,000 have crossed the border into Egypt. 4,200 are expected to arrive tomorrow in Crete. And 22,000 have fled into Tunisia. Alan Pizzi now from the border of Tunisia and Libya on the chaotic battle to get out. The desperation of Egyptian workers fleeing Libya underscores how frightening the fight to oust Colonel Muammar Gaddafi has become. The border crossing into Tunisia is frenzied as thousands fight for places on buses. Their exodus from the best paying jobs most of them will ever have is descending into mayhem. A few miles along the road, the scene is the exact opposite, but the problem no less acute. Roadside markets rely on customers from Libya to buy goods smuggled from their own country and sold more cheaply here. But the supply of both is drying up. I haven't had a customer all day, this store owner says. Business is terrible. The biggest illicit item is fuel, smuggled from Libyan refineries and sold in makeshift stalls. Oil links everyone affected by the turmoil in Libya. These fleeing foreign workers need the jobs it pays for. The West needs the supply and prices to stabilize, and Gaddafi's fate depends on it. He must retain control over at least some production to have any hope at all of clinging to even a shred of power. Anti-Gaddafi forces have seized control of oil fields in the area around Benghazi in the east. Two-thirds of all Libyan oil production and the main export facilities are in a strip stretching south from the Gulf of Sirte, some of which has already fallen to the rebels. The other major production area is in the southwest, where no one is sure what is happening. <laughs> the mad scramble of laborers clawing their way out of one of the world's top ten oil producers shows how alarming the situation is for everyone. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, on the Libya-Tunisia border. Also today, a bold aerial rescue by the British took Westerners working in oil fields in the Libyan desert out of harm's way and brought them to safety on the small island nation of Malta. Harry Smith is there this evening with first-person stories of Americans who escaped from the turmoil. 
Britain used cargo planes to airlift several hundred oil field workers out of the desert areas of Libya today. The planes landed here in Malta, where a ferry paid for by the U.S. State Department docked last night, delivering Americans and others from the chaos of Tripoli. Among them, Diane and Dennis Harris from Canton, Ohio, who'd always dreamed of living and teaching abroad. Six months into a two-year commitment in Libya, it was all they had hoped for. A blast. It has been a grand adventure. So this was our retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is until last Sunday, when the Gaddafi regime's response to the protest turned ugly. They didn't see it, they heard it. You could hear a lot of machine gun fire, because they were very quick, repetitious automatic weapons being fired. And, uh, but it was all around us. Days of frustration followed. Their flights kept getting canceled at jammed Tripoli airport. The ferry was their only way out. I really haven't had a chance to cry. And I think that once I get on the plane, that's probably when <laughs> the tears are just going to flow. The Harrises learned a lesson they won't soon forget. What Americans take for granted, Libyans are paying for dearly. To feel what they feel uh, it became very real. Um, how blessed we are in America to have what we have and um, how, how hope, hopeful we are that the people in Libya can experience that too. The Harrises were in love with their jobs at the International School in Tripoli. They fell in love with the students and they said as soon as it's safe, they want to go back. Russ? Harry Smith in Malta. Thank you. And still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, demonstrations across the nation in support of Wisconsin's public employees. Tens of thousands of activists rallied across the country today in state capitals like Albany, New York, and dozens of other cities, including Dallas, to show solidarity with unionized public workers in Wisconsin. One of the bigger rallies was in Chicago, and Cynthia Bowers was there. For the thousand or so activists who protested in Chicago today in support of Wisconsin's public employee unions, the rallying cry was unity. Start doing away with the unions and then you have no rights at all. Many here carried signs against Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, a Republican who wants to balance his state's budget shortfall by requiring public workers to pay more into their pension and health care plans and to end public employee unions' right to collective bargaining. It's that attempt to weaken decades of public union clout that is bringing tens of thousands to the Capitol building in Madison day after day and to rallies around the country today. The fear that unions may one day disappear from American life. I feel like we're the frog in the water and they're turning it up to boil. Before we know it, it's too late. That's why State Senator John Erpenbach has been on the run for 10 days now. One of the 14 Wisconsin Democrats seeking exile in Illinois. In effect, shutting down the Senate to avoid a losing vote. What we did was a very extreme thing. And I can't imagine any other issue that would cause us to say, okay, we're out of here. Public sentiment is saying that you guys should be in the state dealing with this, not out of state. We're doing our jobs. Uh, we're standing up for, again, not only what we believe in, but what the people of the state believe in. This divisive debate isn't isolated to Wisconsin. Twelve other states are currently considering curbing public employee union power as part of budget balancing. Russ? Cynthia Bowers in Chicago, thank you. Right now, we want to tell you about a San Francisco treat. Last night, this one, a rare one, snowfall for the first time since 1976. It was just a dusting in hilly areas, but most there seemed pretty thrilled about it. And just ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, cold cases from the civil rights era and the students who won't let them be forgotten. February is Black History Month, and one chapter in the long civil rights struggle still demands attention today, many years after the events in question. And that's tonight's Weekend Journal, Cold Cases, and the dedicated young people who are trying to solve them. The 4th of July was the last time I saw my brother alive. That was 1964, and Julia Dobbins has been looking for her brother, Joseph Edwards, ever since. I would sit there and look for him. I never thought he was dead. According to this FBI report, 
25-year-old Edwards was last seen in Vidalia, Louisiana on July 12, 1964. Officials believe he was kidnapped and killed by a small clique of Klansmen called the Silver Dollar Group. 47 years later, his body is still missing. Who could do a person like that? Take him away with just like they was never. They feel some responsibility to the victims. It's that mystery this group of professors and law students at Syracuse University's law school hopes to solve. 40, 40 more years is a long time to wait for somebody to care. In 2007, Professor Paula Johnson started the Cold Case Justice Initiative. It's the only university-based program of its kind and receives no outside funding. The students are currently investigating the Edwards case, as well as 30 other civil rights era deaths. Earlier this year, the group's research helped uncover a suspect in the 1964 killing of a Louisiana man. Frank Morris. People who committed these acts, who continue to roam our society freely, um, should not be allowed to do that with impunity. Because so much time has passed, solving these cases can be daunting. Last summer, the Justice Department announced it was closing half of the 110 civil rights era cold cases it was pursuing. 39 of them because the suspects are dead. But families still want answers. For some people, justice is going to mean knowing who committed the acts because there is a continuing injustice just to not knowing that information. So these students spend countless hours combing FBI files and researching old newspaper reports. You'll just think that nothing is ever going to be found. And then finally, in the fifth hour, you know, a little article right there. In the summer, they travel south to retrace victim steps and search for possible witnesses. But these students say they're also trying to heal decades-old family wounds. It's a living day reminder that nobody cared. Dobbins is still waiting. Her brother's case is still open, and the uncertainty still painful. How would you feel if it was somebody in your family that you saw them one day and you never seen them again, you don't know what happened to them? How would you feel? Although the Justice Department has closed more than 50 cases, the FBI says they can be reopened if new information becomes available. And still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News is a mysterious street artist about to win an Oscar. And finally this evening, not all of the pre-Oscar excitement will be taking place tomorrow on the famous red carpet. A bit of it is already taking place on the Los Angeles streets. Ben Tracy has more on the mystery man known as Banksy. Campaigning for an Oscar by begging for votes is not always pretty. But one man has turned it into an art form. I am a huge fan and I love Banksy's artwork. We've actually been looking for the spot for about 45 minutes. Every morning in the past week, the city of Los Angeles has woken up to a new piece of street art by famed London artist Banksy, often plastered on the side of a building. Banksy is nominated for an Academy Award for his documentary called Exit Through the Gift Shop. It's about street artists like himself. The film is uh, the story of what happened when this guy tried to make a documentary about me, but he was uh, actually a lot more interested than I am. Banksy's own very valuable work creates a scavenger hunt for his fans, from parking lots in Beverly Hills to water tanks in Malibu, random alleys and dirt lots by the freeway. I've never actually seen any of his work in person. I've always seen it in, like, pictures of it. As each piece is discovered, it is quickly documented on the Internet so others can find it, such as this crayon house foreclosure. I had to see it, like, before it was just completely destroyed. A billboard, augmented by Banksy on the Sunset Strip, was quickly ripped down and fought over. Call the cops! Call the cops! This week, Banksy's Charlie Brown creation was literally cut out of a concrete wall. What a shame and reportedly sold on eBay for $8,000. So since Tuesday here in Beverly Hills, Banksy's piece of peeing dog art now has its very own security guard. Of course, part of the attraction here is the mystery. While his work sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars at auction, no one has ever seen Banksy. He works at night, he's never done an interview. Even in his film, Banksy turns the camera on himself only in shadow. It's not about the hype. 
it's not about the money. He knows exactly what he's doing, and I think that hopefully something awesome happens at the Oscar, like he reveals himself. No one knows if he will even show up at the Oscars or how he may disguise himself if he wins, but it's clear from his work this week in L.A. that Banksy already knows how to steal the show. Yeah. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Los Angeles. Banksy. And that is the CBS Evening News. Later on CBS, 48 Hours Mystery. Thanks for joining us this Saturday evening. I'm Russ Mitchell, CBS News in New York. I'll see you again back here tomorrow. Good night.